I must admit that if I stay on mute any longer, I'll start getting a nosebleed. I'm not used to it. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> okay. So uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, today, uh, great to see. Uh, great to see you. Um, we've been talking about uh, uh, inequality uh, and uh, the uh, nature of work and uh, changing work and changing earnings. Uh, as part of inequality. And today I want to talk about uh, the certainly the most uh, important aspect of inequality, and that is poverty. Uh, poverty uh, meaning severe material deprivation. Uh, from all points of view, poverty should be our most important focus when we talk about uh, inequality and when we think about economic justice, because poverty means a deprivation that is so severe that it leads to extreme suffering and to millions of deaths per year, even in a normal non-COVID year. Poverty is real, persistent, pervasive, and solvable. Uh, Poverty could be ended. Uh, it could be ended quickly in the world today. That wasn't true even 50 years ago, but we are in a world of such wealth now. Uh, an average output per person on the planet of more than uh, $12,000 uh, per person uh, measured in uh, international prices that's easily enough to uh, end all of the extreme poverty on the planet. Uh, in fact, uh, the world is so perverse these days that six, uh, five, I'm sorry, 500 people, uh, the world's uh, richest people uh, with uh, a net worth uh, today of about $8 trillion for 500 people, uh, have the wherewithal to end poverty uh, for uh, a billion people or more. Uh, part of the uh, reality of our age is that this is not seen as shocking and a scandal. We have uh, become, or we are deadened to it, or unaware, or we're filled with excuses, which uh, have been the shock of my adult life that these issues are not uh, the preeminent issues of economics, politics, and morality, because we live in a world of wealth where people suffer from extreme deprivation. Just amazing. And so today I want to talk about that in terms of uh, what we mean by poverty, how we measure it, where it exists, how it's changed, how we approach it ideologically, intellectually, and in policy terms. And uh, let me get started. I'm going to have to uh, finish uh, um, myself at uh, about five minutes to the hour. Tony's going to uh, take over uh, at that point, uh, and so the discussion will continue. But <clears throat> I have, a, uh, uh, unfortunately, a conflict uh, starting at, uh, at 10 a.m. So uh, let me uh, share my screen. And this is our topic, the crisis of poverty. And I wanna call it a crisis because it is uh, deadly and uh, solvable. Uh, and uh, we need to understand both the uh, essence of poverty in our world today intellectually uh, and uh, ethically and in policy terms. So I think the right starting point is to, oops, why did that happen? There we go. Uh, is to uh, start with the definitions of poverty. And there are many definitions in practice that are used. So I want you to be aware of them. First, uh, there is a concept of absolute poverty, meaning poverty that uh, is uh, 
uh, a condition of extreme material deprivation uh, that we translate uh, in the first instance to not having enough income per person. But what we really mean by not having enough income per person is not having the wherewithal to have a safe, secure life with the basic physiological needs assured, enough food, enough nutrients in the food, uh, enough safe water, sanitation, shelter, uh, access to uh, health care, especially for emergencies. So absolute poverty is a state of extreme material deprivation that we now measure <coughs> very imperfectly uh, uh, by the household income. Relative poverty uh, is a condition of having an income that is so far below the societal standard that uh, those in relative poverty may have their basic needs met, but they have a hard time living full lives of dignity and uh, achieving uh, their capacities. So relative poverty is, uh, can be at a, in a rich country like ours, can be at a level of material conditions that are not extreme deprivation but are enough deprivation that people in relative poverty do not lead lives of adequate esteem, uh, role in society, protection from abuse, uh, and uh, ability to uh, uh, ability to uh, reach uh, one's uh, capacities. Multidimensional poverty is uh, simply a term that's used. Uh, to denote the fact that what we mean by material deprivation generally cannot be uh, measured only by the household income. As we know very well, uh, what individuals and households uh, receive uh, in the flow of goods and services depends not only on their income, but also on the government services that are provided. And so there's a difference of having a certain level of income in a place where there's also a health service provided by government versus a place where there's no health service. Or uh, multidimensional poverty can be relative to the geographic realities of a location People can be poor if they are vulnerable to recurrent natural hazards in a particular location to floods, droughts, locusts, uh, extreme storms, malaria, and so forth. Whereas at the same level of income in another setting uh, that is safer from a geographic point of view, you would uh, consider that household not in poverty. So multidimensional poverty puts the emphasis on access to basic or primary goods like health, education, uh, livelihoods, uh, and so on. Uh, and the state of being in multidimensional poverty, I believe, uh, also should be viewed regarding uh, or in the context of the actual geography uh, in which uh, the household is being considered. National poverty is uh, the rate of poverty as defined by a national government. The United States has a national poverty line, which is distinct from the absolute poverty line of the World Bank, the relative poverty line of the OECD, the multidimensional poverty index kept by uh, the University of Oxford, uh, the U.S. has its own national poverty line, which is uh, defined, uh, as I'll explain uh, in just a moment. So the 
most common measure of extreme or absolute poverty, and I'll use those terms interchangeably, absolute poverty or extreme poverty, is uh, a uh, measure of uh, individuals living below a certain number of dollars per day. Even that question has uh, requires a um, clear definition because it could be having an income below that amount per day or having a consumption of goods below that amount per day. And as the World Bank, which is the keeper of these official comparative data, measure extreme poverty, it's the consumption per person per day put into a dollar value. So by consumption would mean the daily, uh, uh, the, the uh, daily diet valued at a market price, the uh, daily uh, use of the shelter valued at a market rent, uh, and the daily uh, purchase of uh, health services valued at an international price and so forth. And so the standard is consuming at under $1.90 per day per person. That $1.90 per day is not uh, the $1.90 uh, in our wallet in the US. It's a $1.90 of goods and services measured at a standardized set of international prices, not necessarily US prices. Uh, in US prices, which are higher for many of the items on the list, it's a roughly three times that dollar ninety. So it would be something like living six dollars a day in our uh, US environment. So think of it as something like two thousand dollars per person per year of consumption but at the standardized international prices at a dollar 90 per day or about $700 per person per year of consumption. These are using prices as of 2011. So the technical definition is a dollar 90 per day of consumption per person measured at purchasing power 2011 constant prices. So that's a mouthful, but essentially it's like living at 2000 to $2,500 per year in familiar US prices, pretty poor. By that standard, the map of extreme poverty as of 1990 looks like what you see here. Uh, the poorest regions of the world were tropical Africa. And when I use the phrase tropical Africa, remember, I mean Africa south of the uh, North African countries, uh, that is uh, Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, Libya, and Egypt, south of those, so sub-Saharan, and north of South Africa, Botswana, uh, Swaziland, and Namibia. So tropical Africa is the poorest part of the world. And then in 1990, East Asia, China, Indonesia, and South Asia, India, Pakistan, Nepal, were among the poorest places in the world. Widespread poverty of more than half of the population living in extreme poverty. Uh, North America, Canada, and the United States, and Western Europe did not have the uh, uh, extreme poverty by this standard, nor did Russia. And South America and Central America, in other words, Latin America, was a middle-income country with a modest amount of extreme poverty, maybe under 30 percent, uh, and in most places, under 20 percent of the population. Now, fast forward uh, to uh, 2017, the most recent World Bank data. The most notable fact is that China escaped from extreme poverty uh, by this definition. And by this definition, China went from 
more than 80% extreme poverty in 1980 to no extreme poverty in 2020. China officially celebrated the end of extreme poverty in 2020. I, I've been going to China for exactly these 40 years. My first trip was 1981. Uh, at uh, some points, I was uh, asked by the government in China to visit poor parts of China to look with my own eyes at the nature of the poverty and give any suggestions as to what might be done. So I spent uh, several years and summers visiting uh, rural and urban Western China where most poverty was. And I will uh, tell you, uh, though, uh, impressionistically, that China really did end poverty. Uh, it's not only a slogan or, or propaganda, but extreme poverty was eliminated by China's rapid development. That means that uh, probably more than a billion people uh, were removed from the extreme poverty line. During this period, uh, India, uh, also dramatically reduced the rate of poverty, though South Asia remains on the poorer side. Uh, so that as of today, extreme poverty is heavily concentrated in tropical Africa. This is the last region of the world with a high extent of extreme poverty. By the World Bank's <laughs> estimates, uh, roughly 8% of the world lives in extreme poverty. That's not bad, uh, actually. It's, it's not just, but it's not bad considering where we came from. Let me emphasize that we care about extreme poverty uh, because it means real deprivation, even deprivation of life itself. People in extreme poverty die young uh, and uh, <laughs> with a high infant mortality rate, a high under five mortality rate, and a low adult life expectancy. So you see the lowest life expectancy is in tropical Africa. And uh, South Asia uh, is the second region of low life expectancy. Fortunately, uh, most of the Americas, uh, North Africa, China, certainly uh, Western Europe, uh, and Eastern, Central and Eastern Europe have life expectancy of above 70 years, uh, and in many cases, uh, above 75 years, and for the highest uh, life expectancy, of course, above 80 years. So extreme poverty matters. The ex high concentration of extreme poverty today is in uh, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. The multidimensional poverty index aims to move beyond this dollar metric to look specifically at conditions of life for primary commodities or sometimes called uh, economic needs or sometimes called economic rights. And so it's looking at uh, whether the population is in a region of uh, child undernutrition, uh, child mortality, uh, absence of schooling, uh, or standard of daily life in terms of water, sanitation, electricity, uh, safe shelters, and so forth that is inadequate. And if one looks at the multidimensional poverty index that is created by Oxford, it uh, is a better measure, but it tracks more or less the patterns uh, that we saw with the World Bank's income-based measure. Now, a different kind of measure is relative poverty, and that is measured as households whose incomes are too low to be in the mainstream of societal life and societal well-being. And the OECD, which is, as you know, the countries of the high-income world with some upper income, middle income, I mean, upper middle income countries in, uh, uh, especially in Latin America, uh, measures relative poverty as having a household income 
that is under 50% of the median household income. So roughly speaking, I don't know the number for the moment, but a U.S. median household income uh, is today uh, probably around $75,000. Uh, and so half of that, uh, roughly uh, $37,500 would be the threshold. And the OECD would say, if the household earns less than half of the median, then it's considered to be in relative poverty. Notice that that means a household uh, that in the United States, say of 25 or $30,000 income, that's not absolute poverty, but it's too poor to be in the mainstream of uh, social and economic life. By this standard, uh, the United States has poverty uh, in fact, quite a bit of it. Uh, we have more poverty than uh, almost any uh, of the OECD countries. The lowest amount of poverty is Iceland, uh, Czech Republic, Denmark, Finland, Slovenia, and so on, which you see on the left-hand side where the relative poverty rate is around 5% of the population. And according to this measure, the U.S. poverty rate is 17 or 18 percent of U.S. households. So roughly one in five are below half of the median level of income, not extreme deprivation, relative deprivation. Then there is the national poverty line. And the national poverty line in the United States was originally calculated in the 1960s to ask whether there was food sufficiency for households, whether they had enough income to feed themselves properly. And then above that food need was added a margin for shelter, clothing, transport, and so on. It's not a precise sociological measure, but because it was put as the basis for various legislative metrics, and Census Bureau standards, it's very hard to change the uh, definition of poverty because it has become very, very political. But in this illustration, which I think is for the year 2016, actually, and it shows uh, in a little box the poverty line definitions for 2018, for a family of four, the US poverty line is to have a, 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 an income of $25,100 or less for a family of four. And this map shows as of 2016, according to the US Census Bureau, uh, the proportions of states in poverty. Notice that uh, poverty is more prevalent in the South than it is in the North. Uh, and uh, this is one longstanding feature of American life. It's also a profound paradox of American politics because the North tends to be more progressive and redistributionist in US history and the South quite resistant, but generally because the South uh, has had a culture of white supremacy and a culture of uh, racial division. And uh, whites in the South uh, typically have opposed government policies that are generally redistributional because they redistribute to poor African Americans as well as to poor whites. And so my interpretation of this picture uh, is that uh, poverty in the South has persisted at higher rates in no small part because uh, white racism uh, has led to an antagonism to more active government policies uh, in the United States and poor whites and poor African Americans have suffered the consequence of uh, that uh, white supremacist culture. Uh, this is not the only view of the situation, but it is my uh, considered view. Uh, of uh, why we're looking at a US map in this way. But suffice it to say for our purposes right now that uh, this is the US definition 
of poverty. It's a US only poverty standard. By this standard, uh, incidentally, the poverty rate came down during the 1960s, especially with the introduction of policies like Medicare, which uh, greatly reduced elderly poverty, uh, as well as other great society programs, uh, but then has remained between uh, 10 and 15% of the population by the American poverty line standard uh, between then and now without further progress. Uh, the top graph shows the absolute numbers of people in poverty. Uh, the bottom graph shows the rate of poverty dividing by the total population. Now, not surprisingly, if we look at back to the extreme poverty measure of the World Bank, it is negatively related to the gross domestic product per capita, which is a measure of the average output per person in the economy. So when that is higher in dollar terms, then the proportion of households or individuals living below $1.90 consumption is lower. And that's why you can see uh, essentially that there's a downward sloping relationship between GDP and income to around $10,000 per capita, after which economies with $10,000 or higher in GDP per capita have almost no extreme poverty. And below $10,000 per person, the poorer the country in terms of GDP per capita, the higher is the proportion of individuals living in extreme poverty, which is shown in the vertical axis here. So this is a, an important scatter diagram for you to look at. And it's basically the case that when GDP per capita is around $5,000, the poverty rate in this society is roughly 20%. When GDP is about $15,000 per capita, there's essentially no extreme poverty left. Beyond income of 15,000, like the United States, uh, where the GDP per capita is now over 60,000, you don't get further gain in ending absolute poverty because absolute poverty has been eliminated at a lower level. A similar graph is shown here, uh, where on the vertical axis is not the proportion of households in extreme poverty, but the proportion of households that answer a question to a Gallup survey of whether they are dissatisfied with their living standard because they don't have enough to buy. And here again, it's a different concept because uh, being satisfied with the one's uh, living standard uh, is a different question from having the basics. And uh, people are dissatisfied even when they have the basics, they want more than the basics. But this shows a graph that looks just like the previous one. It's a downward slope to a certain threshold and then flat after that. So if you compare this structure and this structure, they're the same, but with a shifting uh, uh, access uh, for income, households tend to be satisfied with their living standards for $40,000 and above in this world, that's the high income world. By that time, the large preponderance of households says that they're satisfied with their living standards. Though in the United States, even though we're rich, more than 20% say they're not satisfied because we have so much inequality and therefore so many people living in relative poverty. Uh, but for people living in countries uh, below that $40,000 threshold, uh, say below 10,000 per capita, then you have 50, 60, 70% of people dissatisfied with their living standards, not surprisingly. So the major point is the world has gotten richer over the last two centuries, though unevenly. And in the places where uh, wealth came fastest, extreme poverty was eliminated first. 
relative poverty? Not necessarily, because that depends on income inequality, not on absolute deprivation. On places that are still poor, measured as GDP per capita, poverty rates remain high today. <clears throat> so broadly speaking, uh, the industrial age and now the digital age has seen a remarkable decline of absolute or extreme deprivation. Uh, a couple of studies that have tried to measure uh, absolute deprivation uh, give these two uh, definitions, but basically absolute poverty was something like 90% of the world population in 1820. Everyone was living close to subsistence and by today under 10%. So broadly speaking, a big economic success. That's why we can be optimistic about the end of poverty, but not complacent about it, because we should be able to achieve zero extreme poverty if we put our minds to it and do that quite quickly. Of course, the numbers are tending to come down with economic growth, but not fast enough. And the loss of lives to poverty remains large. Different regions have experienced different paths of decline. And this is the World Bank measure, according to the World Bank's definition of $1.90 per day for several regions of the world. And I would draw your attention to a few facts. First, it's on a downward path for every region. Every region has experienced some decline of uh, extreme poverty. Second, uh, as of the 1980s, Latin America uh, and European and Middle Eastern and North African poverty were already relatively low, below 10%, second point. Third point, look at the red line. That's East Asia and Pacific dominated by China. Whoa, the poverty rate was more than 80% in 1981, and it is close to zero as of 2015. That is China's remarkable success, but not only China, other countries in East Asia experienced dramatic declines. The uh, olive color line below the red line is South Asia dominated by India but also including Pakistan, Bangladesh, uh, and, uh, uh, and others. Uh, and here we see that uh, poverty has come down significantly, but not as dramatically and decisively as in East Asia. And then finally, the top blue line is Sub-Saharan Africa. And you can see that the poverty rate has come down in Africa from a peak of around 60% in the mid 1990s or the early 1990s to around 40% as of 2015. Sub-Saharan Africa is the poorest part of the world, but it is also experiencing a decline of poverty, but not as fast as the decline underway in South Asia, and certainly not as fast as the decline of East Asia. So I say to my friends and colleagues in Africa, that China provides a, a, a template or role model of how it would be possible to move much faster in ending extreme poverty. That's a complicated story because I'm not talking about political system, I'm talking about economic strategy. The politics will be very different. Africa has 54 countries, Sub-Saharan Africa, 49 countries, uh, China won a centralized administrative state. Uh, and so there obviously are huge differences, but the pace of decline of poverty in East Asia is impressive, inspiring, and instructive in my view. So in terms of absolute numbers of people living in extreme poverty, the picture looks like this. Uh, and again, uh, you can see that 
the absolute numbers of people in sub-Saharan Africa in extreme poverty have increased by a small number. But since the denominator, the total population has increased rapidly, the proportion has gone down. Whereas in East Asia and the Pacific, the numbers in extreme poverty went to zero. And in South Asia, they went to much lower numbers. So this is uh, uh, the world distribution, meaning that most of the remaining extreme poverty is in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, this is a useful diagram because the red line shows the decline of worldwide uh, poverty as a proportion of world population. And the lower uh, blue line shows the proportion for the nine Chinese world. So if you include China in the world data, uh, you get the fastest decline, of course, because of China's success. If you look at the non-China part of the world population, you also get a marked favorable downward trend in poverty, but not as uh, dramatic. Uh, and uh, this is another uh, illustration. People, the green areas, the numbers not in poverty, the brown area is the numbers living in extreme poverty. You can see that in 1820 on the left-hand side, the world was poor. And on, as of 2015, the world is mostly not in extreme poverty. So a huge part of our political, economic, social, and individual lives are debating, why is there poverty? And this debate has been going on for more than 2,000 years. And uh, different people, generally innocent of data, uh, argue different uh, uh, answers to that question. And just to quickly state them, uh, a predominant view has been by people living in comfort that people living in poverty are in poverty because they lack the aptitude. They don't make the effort. They are not virtuous. They lack the skills to be out of poverty. So those judgmental attitudes are, I would say, the predominant explanations that have been given in, throughout a lot of history. The poor are poor because it's their own fault. Uh, of course, people have recognized that various kinds of disabilities or conditions uh, can uh, exist regardless of uh, individual effort. Uh, a third kind of explanation uh, that has been manifest in the world, especially, uh, well, from, I would say, uh, from the start of philosophizing and theorizing, uh, but then especially after uh, the Colombian voyage, voyage uh, of discovery uh, has been cast that uh, the poor are poor because they are an inferior group in society. Uh, and in the United States, uh, much of US history and culture has been a uh, very frankly uh, explicit white supremacist culture uh, and of course, uh, anti uh, Native American culture, a caste system that uh, where poverty has been extremely high uh, among African uh, American populations, slavery and then apartheid Jim Crow and continuing discrimination uh, and uh, white supremacists have attributed that to white superiority. Uh, but a fourth explanation, of course, is the converse of that, that it is a matter of exploitation and discrimination. And so Karl Marx uh, and uh, many others, and I will add my name uh, to the list, believe that a lot of poverty is the result of various forms of exploitation and caste or race-based discrimination. Another theory uh, of poverty, uh, especially uh, Calvinist, uh, has been that poverty is uh, a result of God's inscrutable will, 
uh, and uh, that uh, one's not to ask, but maybe it's a sign of lack of God's favor. And it transmuted to America uh, a popular Protestant notion, evangelical Protestant notion, is that prosperity is the return to uh, true belief and poverty is a measure of uh, one's insincerity of belief. So in many prosperity gospel congregations in the United States over the last 50 years, people have been told you're poor because you are insufficient or insincere in your faith. I think it's a double cruelty to be told that because you're poor and then you're told it's your own fault uh, by uh, lack of uh, faith. So give more to the church uh, and uh, maybe uh, uh, your bank account will, will grow is the idea of prosperity gospel. Uh, another uh, theory of poverty, analytical uh, and with a lot of merit is that it's intergenerationally or class-based determined that children of the well-to-do tend to be well-to-do, well-schooled, well-fed, well-nourished, uh, well-provided, uh, whereas uh, children growing up in poverty tend to remain in poverty. And there is a tremendous intergenerational transmission of poverty. Ro uh, Thomas Robert Malthus, uh, the uh, English parson and uh, uh, early social theorist that was uh, contemporary with Adam Smith uh, and uh, soon after Smith uh, believed that it was a matter of demography. Too many people on scarce land driving down living standards. And so Malthus gave not an individual reckoning, but a, uh, uh, a, uh, an environmental reckoning uh, that poverty reflected the earth's limited carrying capacity. Uh, now, uh, many argue that poverty is the result of environmental shocks and infirmities, that poor people are increasingly being displaced by climatic shocks or loss of biodiversity and so forth. Uh, poor governance is another favorite explanation. Uh, when I worked uh, intensively on African poverty, the thing that I heard more than any other explanation of African poverty was that uh, it was because governments were corrupt. Uh, since I came from a country with an incredibly corrupt political system that was rich, I tended to be skeptical. Uh, I kept telling them, if you want to see corruption, go to Washington. Uh, but uh, there is a widespread view that it's corruption uh, in poor countries. It's another way in my experience of blaming the poor for their suffering. And then uh, many analysts with a lot of merit say bad luck. People end up poor because of idiosyncratic bad luck. Well, with all of those varying explanations, there are also widely varying ethical responses. Uh, the Jewish and early Christian traditions uh, the Jewish uh, uh, law in uh, of Deuteronomy in the Mosaic Code, uh, Jesus's teachings, uh, the church, uh, and uh, modern uh, Christian social teachings all uh, argue for the need for mercy and charity uh, to address the needs of poverty. This is, uh, in my view, the core of Western ethics uh, and very powerful. Calvinism brought a, a quite harsh view, which is that in God's inscrutable will, the poor are poor and probably a sign of their own insufficiencies, lack of favor, lack of being the elect. Uh, in Adam Smith's economics, <laughs> and especially the British economics that followed, uh, the ethical response to poverty was leave it alone. If you try to make it better, you'll make it worse. A utilitarian vision of poverty, depending on which utilitarian, is do something to make it better, but often with a very harsh approach. The uh, more modern human rights and capabilities approach to poverty says that people have the right 
to be not poor. Uh, and this is reflected in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights uh, in the idea that uh, everybody has the right to a living standard consistent with human dignity and human needs, a right to food, to shelter, to livelihoods, to education, to health care, to social protection. And Amartya Sen has put this human rights approach uh, as a what he calls a capabilities approach, that everybody has the right to the conditions uh, to pursue their capabilities. John Rawls also has a, his own variant of a human rights and capabilities approach by saying that uh, justice requires improving to a maximum extent the position of the least favored members of society. And of course, the current libertarian approach is a kind of extreme laissez-faire. Uh, Ayn Rand, <coughs> Robert Nozick, and others saying uh, there is no such thing as redistributive or distributive justice. There is only private property and individual liberty, and therefore no call to help the poor. Uh, this leads to very different views about policy. And I want to end just by giving a very quick uh, measure of the uh, different approaches. In the biblical era, uh, both the uh, probably uh, post-exilic uh, uh, state of, uh, of Judah, uh, the uh, Jewish uh, kingdom after the return from uh, the exile in, uh, in uh, Babylonia, uh, the teachings that were propounded were for a social justice within uh, the society. Uh, and uh, in Leviticus, for example, uh, the uh, gleanings from uh, the harvest are to be left for the poor uh, and uh, for the needy and for the stranger. In Deuteronomy, uh, which is basically uh, the uh, Mosaic law, uh, is emphasized by the post-exilic uh, Jewish uh, community, uh, the Sabbath, the day off, applies also to the slaves and to the donkeys. So there were slaves, but every individual had a right to a day off. Uh, and uh, these injunctions come with the repeated reminder that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, you were uh, redeemed, uh, and you therefore uh, remember your uh, condition of servitude and treat others with mercy and with justice. And I think it's a uh, very unusual uh, breakthrough in ethical thinking, but the constant reminder that because you were a slave, you should treat uh, others uh, with, the, with the, their rights and dignity. Uh, and uh, again, uh, in, Leviticus, in Leviticus, it says, uh, uh, in case a countryman of yours becomes poor uh, and his means with regard to you oops, falter, then you are to sustain him like a stranger or a sojourner. You are to sustain him. Why? <laughs> because you were uh, a stranger in the land of Egypt. Uh, and I, uh, uh, the, the Lord your God, brought you uh, from Egypt. Uh, and similarly, uh, in Deuteronomy, uh, that you shall not harden your heart nor close your hand from your poor brother. So this is the beginning of uh, the Jewish and Christian uh, ethics. Of course, uh, Jesus uh, teaches uh, in Matthew 25 uh, that the ultimate judgment is uh, that he who feeds the hungry, the thirsty, the stranger, clothes the stranger, visits the imprisoned, uh, is the righteous one who will find uh, eternal life. Uh, and he who does not uh, will go into eternal punishment. So Matthew 25 is uh, uh, Jesus' teachings, uh, but it is essentially the teachings of mercy and addressing the needs of the poor 
as uh, the uh, most important of the ethical teachings. So compare this with the, the uh, Calvinist uh, approach uh, after the Reformation. John Locke, the uh, English philosopher uh, who represents uh, this new approach, writes in 1697 about the poor, uh, and his view is completely different. Uh, he says the multiplying of the poor and the increase of the tax for their maintenance is of so general an observation and complaint that it cannot be doubted. Now, what do we do about it? Uh, Locke says, if the cause of this evil be well looked into, we humbly conceive it will be found to have proceeded neither from scarcity of provisions nor from want of employment for the poor, since the goodness of God has blessed these times with plenty. The growth of the poor must therefore have some other cause, and it can be nothing else but the relaxation of discipline and corruption of manners, virtue and industry being as constant companions on the one side as vice and idleness are on the other. So Locke is the exemplar of the emerging British view that the poor have themselves to blame and therefore need to be treated harshly. We move from uh, mercy to harshness in approach. Locke actually writes, oops, if any boy or girl under 14 years of age shall be found begging out of the parish where they dwell, they shall be sent to the next working school there to be soundly whipped. This is a boy or girl under 14 to be whipped and kept at work until evening so that they may be dismissed time enough to get to their place or abode that night. Uh, and then he says, uh, beside the grown people, the children of laboring people are an ordinary burden to the parish and are usually maintained in idleness so that their labor is generally lost till they are 12 or 14. Okay, here's John Locke, our great philosopher. The most effectual remedy for this that we are able to conceive and which we therefore humbly propose is that in the forementioned new law to be enacted, it is to be further provided that working schools shall be set up in each parish to which the children of all such, of, of all such as demand relief above age three and under 14, while they live, whilst they live at home with their parents and are not otherwise employed shall be obliged to come. So children age three are to be forced to work. This is the emergence of a special kind of cruelty. And it ends up being played out time and time again, including uh, in famously uh, in the Irish famine where the British government does nothing essentially uh, to relieve the famine conditions. And uh, the UK, the British treasury reports that it is not the function of government to provide supplies of food or to increase the productive powers of the land. And John Stuart Mill, another, uh, the leading liberal philosopher says, it may require a hundred thousand armed men to make the Irish people submit to the common destiny of working in order to live. We must give over telling the Irish that it is our business to find, we must give over telling the Irish that it is our business to find food for them. We must tell them now and forever that it is their business. This is the sentiment in the middle of a famine. So unfortunately I have to stop there, but what I uh, want to, uh, what I would like us to spend uh, more time on is this remarkable transformation of philosophy and approach from an approach of mercy and a remembrance that each of us was in our own way vulnerable to poverty or to enslavement to a philosophy of retribution and extraordinary harshness. And I believe that this is one of the reasons why in a world of wealth, we still have a billion people in extreme deprivation. We still have people dying 
by the millions each year because they don't have the basic sustenance, even though a few hundred people on the planet have the wherewithal to end that kind of suffering. The attitude is a kind of punishment. Uh, it is to say the poor are the exploiters of the rich. Uh, that's literally what Ayn Rand comes to in the 20th century, uh, that not only do we not have responsibility to the poor, we should view the poor like John Locke did as burdens to society, as exploiters of the well-off. It's an extraordinary turn of uh, ethical ideas. I think it has no ethical merit, nor does it have uh, any economic uh, uh, merit uh, in terms of diagnostics uh, or remedy, uh, but it has a widespread prevalence uh, in social belief. So unfortunately, I have to run right now. I'm a couple minutes late. Tony, I'm going to pass it to you, and uh, I will see everybody in a week's time. Thanks. Thanks very much. Good morning, everybody. Happy Easter. Um, I will continue on Friday talking about some of the policies uh, for on that that we talk about when, on the crises of poverty. But um, let's have a discussion now. Let's because we. The problem with this Zoom teaching is you don't really get a chance to interact. So let's try and interact and get it and have a discussion. Do you have any reactions, comments, questions to what Jeff was talking about this morning? Uh, any any issues you want to raise for discussion? Any questions? Um, Barbara. I, I, was I, I would, okay. I'll go ahead if you want. Uh, I was just going to say that I think that all this inequality is great, but I think that perhaps we should have a little more emphasis on the inequality that also prevails with regard to women throughout the whole yeah. world, which has gone on for generations and centuries forever. Definitely. That's uh, when we get to um, the sustainable development goals. Goal five is basically on gender equity. And that's that's absolutely right. So thanks for thanks for that. And we'll talk more about that. There was another question. Oh, um, Catherine, I just was yes. thinking, I was just thinking about um, when, when he was talking about the Irish potato famine, like growing up and learning about events like that, you kind of just hear like, oh, their potatoes stopped growing and everyone started dying. But you don't hear anything about like, there were so many places where someone else could have intervened, where someone could have helped, who had the power to help. Yeah. And didn't. And I just thought that that was super interesting, like seeing the quote saying, like, it's their problem. We're not going to help them. Yeah. And this has and there's been many more examples of that. There's been a, a very famous uh, Amartya Sen wrote about a famine in Bengal. Um, same thing under the British. And, you know, millions died. And because the dominant philosophy was market forces, uh, market forces work and market forces, the market adjusts. And basically, you saw the thing from uh, Mill and Locke. Uh, uh, you know, it's your job to find food. It's not our job to find food for you. And, you know, by the way, I don't know if you can hear it in my voice, but I grew up in Ireland. Um, so the famine is uh, definitely a part of um, uh, my, um, my history, um, my country's history. And uh, it's definitely a scar that's left there. The, the population of Ireland before the famine in, in the 1840s was 8 million people. Uh, today, it's uh, four and a half million people. Uh, so it's one of the very few countries that's halved its population and never actually got it back because 1 million people died and 1 million people came to the US, which is why there are so many Irish Americans here today. Uh, yeah, so that's uh, it's kind of a tragedy. But as as Jeff was saying, you know, in the world today, we see even though extreme poverty has declined dramatically, there are still, I think, I think the latest number is 736 million people living in extreme poverty, living under a dollar ninety a day, which is a very very limited amount, and. It's kind of stunning. That should be for a wealthy world. That should be our major, major ethical challenge. But you don't really hear about it. 
It's very, it's not in the news. It's not the top, it's not the top of the news cycle. Um, you very rarely hear about it. Um, um, five million children, six, sorry, six million children under the age of five die every year uh, because of um, basic conditions that could be easily remedied with basic health interventions um, like vaccinations or malaria bed nets or things like that very cheaply. But we, we, we decide as a world that it's not worth doing. We don't do it. We don't value saving six million children's lives in places like sub-Saharan Africa. And this is why, by the way, Jeff was talking about some of that stuff from uh, the biblical tradition. And uh, you can see that in my Cathonomics book. We talked about that when I, in much earlier in the course, when we talked about the, the Hebrew tradition, we talked about Jesus, we talked about the early church fathers. And there the very, the, the, the idea was basically, it is our moral duty to take care of the poor and to alleviate extreme poverty and to take care of people. And that really shifted from the 17th century onwards started, you know, we saw it with, today we saw it with John Locke, but also like um, a utilitarian philosopher like John Stuart Mill, who was, wrote famously on the importance of liberty and human rights and democracy and all kinds of things like that, still had horrible views on, on poverty. Um, and of course, if you read the novels of Charles Dickens, they're all about the, um, the horrendous conditions of the early industrial revolution and, and the utter um, moral uh, neglect of, duty, of any duty towards the poor. Uh, okay, I'm rattling on again. Anybody else? Um, uh, I'm, yeah, James. With, with uh, relative poverty, I, I, we don't usually in America call it by that name, but you know the, the worldview that I was brought into when I was a boy was that of makers and takers and um, all of the Reaganomics, the whole trickle down. And I was interested in, in your book, you, you put uh, a discussion about, or you mentioned um, an IMF study where in fact, poverty or um, wealth doesn't trickle down. It actually trickles yeah, up. That's right. Um, I'd be interested in reading that study. That study sounds very interesting. I'll, yeah, I can, I can drop that into the, Blackboard uh, week eight. We're on week. What are we? We're week ten now. I'll put it in week eight, which is the inequality week. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but that's that. That was an interesting study because, you know, the I, I used to work at the IMF. The IMF got captured by kind of neoliberal economics from the eighties and the nineties. It's gradually changing now. I think that though, like, um, I, I think of it like one of those huge big tankers, like the evergreen tanker that blocked up the Suez Canal. It's very hard changing course with one of those huge, huge ships is very hard. It moves very slowly. So that's the way I think of the IMF right now. It's changing course, but it's moving, it's moving much more slowly than I am comfortable with. But you'll see a lot, if you, if you go to the IMF's um, page now, you'll see a lot of stuff on uh, predominant, the, the, the stuff that's predominantly concerning it is, issues of inequality, issues of climate change, and something like that. Jim is holding up a book on, was it Makers and Takers? Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, but as I, I said- But I, I still see that playing out. I mean, that's the central thing that's playing out in American politics right now is whether, whether, whether everybody has the right to their own property and to the hell with the rest of them. Or, yeah. or whether whether we're going to support the least fortunate in society and make it and raise the bar for everybody. Yes, and there was a period in fairly recent American history when it was a much more it was more communitarian. It was more of the belief that we all were all in the same boat and we all care for each other. Like the whole social democratic period after the, between the 1940s and say the 1970s, I would say, and then as as you mentioned things change with Reaganomics in the 1980s. It was much more free market. It's much more you're on your own. Um, poverty is your own fault. You need to work harder. Um, I mean, you heard Paul, Paul Ryan used to say things like this all the time. We don't, want the, we don't want welfare to be a hammock. Well, I don't know if he's ever lived in welfare, but it's not a hammock, that's for certain. Anybody else? 
any views, any comments, any criticisms? Are you enjoying the course? No, I love it. Uh, I got two comments, um, Tony. One is that I'm trying to type in Rana Fuhu for a horse, for horse, wake, makers and takers for a non Ryan Rand view of who the makers are and who the takers really are. The subtitle is something like uh, The Rise of Finance and the Fall of American Business. Uh, uh, the other one, though, is, is what are we going to be able to touch on any Eastern um, spiritual traditions or religious traditions uh, on these topics? You know, not, also, particularly the one on poverty, right? Yeah, not so much in this course, though, if you go to the, um, the MOOC that we have recommended that you all look at uh, in this course, that MOOC will have things on Buddhism and Hinduism, Confucianism that has segments on that. So you can uh, you have to watch the videos because the book has not been published yet. Um, but yeah, that's there. And by the way, that, that's, that's a, good, a good segue into a point I wanted to make that um, I will drop some readings on poverty into the Blackboard this week. One will be from Professor Sachs's book called The Age of Sustainable Development from 2015. He has a chapter on poverty, which I'll put in there. Um, but also there's a whole segment on poverty in the MOOC. So I recommend you look at that um you know the, the link is in the is in the um syllabus uh, it's the sdg academy at it's called ethics in action um i hope some of you have looked at it already for some of the prior courses but there's a whole segment on poverty and i think i do a section uh, which i'll probably probably be regurgitating a little bit on friday yeah so that that was thanks thanks for that 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 reminded me um and you or you put something in the chat yeah rana for Ruhar, a non iron Rand view of who the makers and takers are. Yeah, I like that idea. So, Anybody else? But to, answer your, to answer your question again emphatically, I think this course is great. Is it um, part of the uh, Jesuit Initiative for Transforming Business Education? As and is, would this be a key core, a core yes. course? Yes. Yes. The goal is to kind of this is a test course to see if we can do principles of economics in a different way than is normally taught uh, in thousands of universities all over the world. Um, to ground it more on ethics, to ground it more, but not just ethics, as you saw from what Jeff was doing and, you know, real world facts and figures, as opposed to shifting curves and graphs, which is what most of economics is. Is there a logical economics conference to, sub, to present this course in? Frank has proposed one for the Financial Management Association for the finance course that the team is working on. Is there an economics conference where uh, you I'm, all could present this? I'm not familiar with one, to be honest. Yeah, not familiar with that, unfortunately. Yeah, it's, we're, kind of, we're kind of on our own here uh, right now. Uh, of course, we're getting a lot of support. A lot of the other Catholic schools, the Jesuit schools, are very supportive of what we're trying to do because, you know, uh, we, we talk a lot about biblical traditions, Hebrew uh, uh, scripture. We talk about the church fathers. So there's a, which we, we think is very important for economics, but maybe more mainstream secular schools might uh, not be as keen on that kind of material, but certainly for the Jesuit paradigm, it is important. Okay, one more minute. Anybody else? One, one quick thing. Um, yeah. I think that we all kind of agree that inequality is a bad thing. And there's obviously agreement on that, that absolute poverty is terrible. But I think it'd be interesting to look at how different nations have actually um, materialized that concept of which nations have decided to transfer the most uh, income from the wealthiest people in which in, uh, nations have just yeah. transferred the least income? What, what has been the history of the actual income transfers? And where do people yeah. see, stand as, as a world about how much income transfer is a good thing? Yeah. Well, I think a quick answer to that question is the Scandinavian countries transfer the most and they have the lowest levels of inequality and the highest levels of highest standards of living in the world. Um, and, and they're also 
when we get to happiness studies, they're also the happiest countries in the world, um, despite the weather. Um, yeah. Um, so yeah. Okay. We're at 11 15. So I'll stop there. So, um, I'll see you all on Friday. Uh, we'll continue this topic, uh, of, of poverty and, um, and, uh, we can have a, I'll talk and we can have a, we can have more of a discussion on Friday. Okay. Enjoy your rest of the week. Happy continued Easter. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Professor. Bye. Thank you.